Let's see who Jamie has in store for us today on So You Wanna Start a Business. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of So You Want to Start a Business. I'm Jamie, your host, and today's guest is Diane Yoder. Welcome, Diane. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me today. So this is definitely a topic that, as I discussed with you, a a topic that we really wanted to cover on the show. Uh, It's been a popular topic that people have wanted me to get a guest on and just never did really work. Mm -hmm. Uh, the, The importance of mental health. Uh, of the day to day. And I think that mental health has definitely become a, a popular topic in society, if you per se, of people understanding and realizing the importance of, mm-hmm. of being able to relax at the end of the day and not have that constant stress on you uh, and how that can affect you. Uh, so with that, go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself and about your uh, business, uh, Bailey Behavioral Health. Okay. Well, about me um i got back i got into mental health uh back in 2011. Um, i had always wanted a career in healthcare, and this was um, an option for me that proved to be pretty you know um, better at the caretaking side of things in terms of you get a longer amount of time with each patient that you see um, and you can really be more impactful with somebody um, versus, you know, like a physician's 15 minute visit or such. So here we get a full hour with somebody at least once a week, which is nice. Um, And we have a big, you know, we can make a big impact that way. Um, So that's kind of why I decided to get into this, you know, into this role in in life. And then um, I worked, you know, at other practices and then eventually, you know, when I became independently licensed, I opened up this practice. So you had worked at other places previously before that mm-hmm. and rolled that into your own business? Yeah. And then I started my own. Mm-hmm. Great. And so tell us a little, I, looking at your website there, it looks like that you have several different types of services uh, as mm-hmm. far as going mental health. And you definitely have a... Uh, a wide array of uh, therapists there with mm-hmm. it looks like with different skills kind of tell us a little bit about the the services that you offer and how that kind of, how what made you decide to have those in your business oh that's a really good question um we primarily we work with you know anxiety depression grief um substance use trauma and uh, a wide variety of other, you know, mood disorders. But um, I feel like some of that found me, you know, in terms of when I started my career, I noticed that, you know, I'd end up with a lot of individuals who, you know, were going through grief or they had a significant amount of anxiety or depression that wouldn't move. So... And when I say move, you know, like lifting that and things that they've tried in the past haven't helped improve that. So I've kind of built my practice around, you know, the cores that I, you know, the core fundamental, you know, um, ailments that I would see, you know, in others across the board and looking at what, you know, our community has to offer here in the Fox Lake area and, you know, the surrounding suburbs. So um, that's kind of how. You know, I decided on like these core things and in Mm -hmm. terms of like modalities, we were kind of eclectic, but we have, you know, we're very person centered, very interpersonal. We do a lot of CBT, which is cognitive behavioral therapy, DBT, which is dialectical behavioral therapy. Um, We also do, we have a therapist who does EMDR, which is the eye movement and desensitization reprocessing type of therapy and that works really well in a lot um, a lot of disorders but specifically works really well with trauma related disorders so where, where were you originally from I am from Chicago so I grew up there and I you know migrated on over to the suburbs in my last year of high school and you know, further then came, you know, I was like in the Elgin area for anybody who knows Illinois and moved on up over here by the Chain of Lakes. 
Which one do you like better, the big city or the suburbs? It depends. I mean, I really, when I was younger, I loved being in the city. Um, now I appreciate, you know, less traffic, more quiet. Mm. <laughs> you can be hidden a lot either. better here. <laughs> uh, I went to Chicago for a couple of classes and stuff like mm -hmm. that in the past. And I don't think this country boy can handle it <laughs> in that fast paced area. Yes. Uh, so what kind of family element did you have growing up as, as far as support system and, and did your support system or your family dynamic kind of help you uh, decide to go into the mental health or the uh, business side? That's a really good question. Um, trying to think in terms of mental health, no, I wouldn't say they really impacted me that way as much as, you know, um, my aunt growing up, I, I lived with her for a significant amount of time and she was very dedicated and driven herself as a person. And so that, and as well as my uncle, that that pushed, you know, me and my cousin to be successful and to want different things out of life and to impact others' lives. So that's how I kind of, you know, got into, I wanted to get into being a physician and that would not afford me the opportunity to also raise children the way that I wanted to. So I, I'm in this field, you know, because I can impact lives better. Mental health with mental health. Um, like, again, with the longer amount of time that we can see people. And what areas do you cover? I, I know you were talking about uh, Illinois and Wisconsin. Do you do just site specific or do you do online uh, therapy yep. and stuff like that? Mm -hmm. We do in person in the office as well as telehealth. So in terms of telehealth, we can see anybody in the whole state of Illinois, which is nice because that includes the more rural areas of people who don't normally have access to healthcare and mental health specifically, because they would often have to drive very far and they may not have the means to do so. So telehealth has really changed over the pandemic in order of offering that option and people being allowed to use their insurance for such um, all across the state, which is great. And then in Wisconsin, the same thing, where you're primarily telehealth up there right now. So we can see anybody in the whole state of Wisconsin, too. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that telehealth has kind of opened up the idea of getting rid of the stigma of mental health? kind of people who have the stigma of, oh, I don't want people to know that I'm having issues in seeing me walk into a brick and mortar to where they can do it more personally online without really people knowing of what's going on? Yes, most definitely. Um, and they don't feel like, oh, I got to take all this time now. The time commitment could be huge to travel to the office, sit in the office and then travel away from, you know, back to wherever they need to. So people can pop in on their lunch hour and, you know, use that time to better themselves, you know, in terms of self-care, in terms of working on whatever's going on with them. Um, so definitely it has opened up, a, you know, you know, a wide range of individuals who normally wouldn't take that time or feel comfortable walking into an in-person session in terms of especially in smaller communities where... They don't want others to know that people, that's people, yeah especially in smaller communities yeah uh, mm -hmm. being from a small town myself it's amazing how people stick their nose where it doesn't necessarily belong exactly and word spreads around quick mm -hmm. <laughs> so what kind of training and education did you have to go through to get to where you are um well for undergraduate school i was in pre-professional studies and um uh, pre-med so that I got degrees in biology, chemistry, marketing, physics. And then I went into graduate school um, several years later. And then I studied, basically, I got a master's in clinical psychology um, counseling. So that in, so in that program, it was a two-year program. We had specific courses we had to take. And then we did practicums where we study and work under someone and we start seeing clients and provide a lot of feedback that way. And then we have to take a few tests 
And one of them is the board, the initial board exam to get the first level of licensure as an LPC, a licensed professional counselor. Once you obtain that, you study under someone for 3,000 hours or equivalent of two years. And with that, then, you know, once you meet all the criteria, you can sit for your next level of licensure to become independently licensed, which is a licensed clinical professional counselor, an LCPC. And that's currently where I am at. So it sounds like a lot, like you're specifically like a medical doctor and the mental health and the medical side training kind of seem to go hand in hand. Yeah, it is an extensive amount of training. Yeah, it is a lot of training. I wouldn't say we're medical doctors, but um, definitely, right, right. definitely a lot of the, the time commitment commit. and the education that goes behind it, mm -hmm. it uh, having someone over you and in right. that aspect. Right. But what about as far as getting the licensing? Uh, is that you said you had to take go before the board and, and take tests and stuff like that? Mm -hmm. uh, and how and what about as far as after you get your uh, licensing is that state specific or how do you go about being able to spread I guess spread your wings and be able to <laughs> go to different states for that right um, that's a really good question because I know there's you know a lot of licensing things going to Congress and such now in order to let us practice across states especially with telehealth getting so huge and being able to see our clients if they go on vacation or have to go to town on business um, so for me specifically I've been licensed in Illinois for quite some time. And recently, because we've been getting an influx of people in Wisconsin, I had to sit for another exam to get a reciprocity license to practice in Wisconsin as well. Hmm. Yeah, and in, that's, sorry. I, I, I've just gone through the, the process as far as for, for life insurance mm -hmm. as well. So, so that's why I was kind of curious to where in life insurance, you, you get your resident license and take your tests and stuff. And then the mm. other states kind of take some of that believability, or I guess I say believability, but the, the idea of, okay, you're qualified in that state. Mm -hmm. We'll do our own make background check and then allow you to do that compared to, I was curious if it was almost like legal where you have to pass a bar exam per se mm -hmm. for each state or something like to that effect. Yeah, um, part of that does have like ethics and laws that we have to follow in our profession. So that is part of the exam. And when I did Wisconsin, it was a lot of um, looking at their statutes and learning, which is very interesting how vastly different the states can be. Mm -hmm. So I think that's part of the problem in terms of getting us across the United States is everybody has their own set of rules, which, you know, I think that that's, you know, wonderful. Um, however, it makes it in terms of making a side pact agreement within our profession a little more difficult because they all have to kind of get on the same page with that. Hmm. Great. Uh, so this is pretty much going through the lightning round. This is a set of questions that I kind of ask pretty much the same to each guest. And the reasoning for that is because each person is a little bit different. Uh, and it's, it's great to see that each person has their own path. Mm -hmm. Uh, to be able to uh, become successful. Yeah. So with that, how old were you when you started your business? Oh, that's a good question. Um, let's see. <laughs> um, 48, so maybe early 40s. Let's just go there because <laughs> I don't know exactly how old I was. So I would say in my early 40s. And how long did it take you to become profitable in your business? Oh, wow. Within the first year, actually. We're still working on it. <laughs> yes. No, actually, within the first year, I, I did pretty well. Okay. Um, I'm, you know, I've always, I've kind of always had like kind of a, a good business sense. So it's, you know, I've worked in real estate in the past and, you know, you kind of learn from that on how to um, run your own business and things. So, um Part of another, you know, thing that I focused on in graduate school was business administration. Mm -hmm. So that also was very helpful for me in terms of doing this. So, yeah, in the first year um, when I started this specific practice, um, within that first year, I was profitable and I was able to grow and add on more therapists within that time frame as well. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that's something I'll go on and say. 
business if anybody out there that even has an inkling of an idea of that they might want to be an entrepreneur lately or later on it is awesome to because i went whenever i went to college and i went into computers mm -hmm. my my minor was business administration too mm -hmm. uh, it's always great to be able to have that as a as a learning experience to know the backgrounds as, as far as going into your own business so right just a little and what was your biggest hurdle getting started Hmm. I would say initially finding office space when we were all, when it was all still in person before the pandemic, you know, and. Well, and what is, is that as far as finding the actual space or as far as the pricing and stuff that kind of went into. Your oh, place? all of that. Definitely. Because if you have to take on too much overhead, you're definitely not going to be able to see, you know, reap the rewards of what you're doing. So yeah, finding the space, but also looking at the census of the population in the area that you're looking at and, you know, how many therapists are already there, you know, really mm -hmm. kind of canvassing to see where the need is greatest. Um, so those who do want to come in person, especially at doing that, you know, pre pandemic time mm -hmm. that they can get here, you know, and that is accessible to them. So I did, you know, I spent a good deal of time on that. Did you, did you find that it's better to go out into the suburbs when, as far as thinking of the, the density of clients and stuff from leaving Chicago? Mm. Yeah, well, once I lived up here, that was also a factor. I didn't want to be too far from my house either in terms of finding an office oh. space so I could get to it pretty quickly, you know, and back, um, back home as well. So that was also a factor. So not really, you know, the city versus the suburbs. I was out of the city a long, long time ago. I, I, can definitely say this as far as a country boy being in that that type of environment i would see the huge need for mental health yeah <laughs> with the, with the day-to-day -day mm -hmm. going through there uh so you talked about you were uh working you know as a, an employee uh, previously mm -hmm. whenever you went to and changed to a business owner did you have a mentor or anybody that you had before that kind of walked you through the process there or did you kind of fly alone um i found my own way actually yeah and how long did it take you before how long did you stay pretty much by yourself before you started to hire your first employees in your business let's see two months maybe yeah almost two months and i knew because um, I filled my caseload pretty quickly, and so I started to look for other people to hire. And how how hard was that to do as far as learning to uh, interview and trust somebody to be a uh, part of your business? Good question. Um, interviewing, I have, you know, I've been working for a lot of years. I started working at age 14, so... I definitely had a good idea in terms of once I got into management, I was starting to work so young by age 19, I was already managing others. So I had a, a good amount of experience by this time in terms of interviewing. Um, oh, there you are. <laughs> and then, so, but finding someone you trust that, you know, is extensive too. Working, having been in mental health, um, you kind of learn what, you know, what is important as a therapist. So when you're interviewing, kind of looking for those things and budding therapists as well was pretty critical in terms of who I hire and who I bring on. So, so the biggest question is, or for me is, so what was harder whenever interviewing somebody that finding somebody that was qualified or somebody that you felt was best to represent your your the name of your business well in order to sit for an interview they have to be qualified so i pre-screen in that way mm -hmm. so i definitely i come through every resume i do a phone interview um and i you know i screen that way before i have them sit here and then mm -hmm. then we go from there and we we look at you know i want to see are they driven what is their clinic cl their clinical skills like um, in terms of, yeah, personality and that fitting, that's really important too, as you're building a group practice. Not that we, you know, it's going to be, everybody's going to be buddy, buddy friends, but mm -hmm. what is their, what is their demeanor like? Are they able to get along well with others? 
you know, are they flexible or are they more rigid? You know, those kind of things you got to look for. So associate with them. Yeah. Yeah. To kind of build that bond compared to somebody hard and the old stigma of, I guess you could say of some, how some would used to view a uh, therapist as far as, you know, the note taking and, <laughs> mm-hmm. and stuff. I can understand that to be able to be able to speak freely to them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that you have to have that kind of connection. Yeah. So let's get into the good stuff as far as what our viewers are definitely here to uh, listen to. And that's your expertise. So whenever you uh, have a lot, what is, I guess the best way to say this Mm -hmm. is what's your kind of, do you see as far as the balance between business owners specifically and then just general uh, pop- population, do you see a higher tick in uh, business owners since they do have that bi- uh, type of stress on them of running a business and then trying to get that home life balance? I think, yes, that I would say there is a little bit of, well, a lot of bit of learning to balance I might, you know, a good stop time, especially now if you work mostly from home, which I do, um, then when is my start and stop times going to be? Because I'll often start first thing in the morning and be still working at 8 p.m. at night every day. Um, like weekends, you know, try to do things with the family. But if I see some downtime, I'm going to grab my computer and start working as well. So, mm-hmm. but yes, yeah, very important to make sure you're doing self-care, doing the things that you need to do. How do you want to integrate with your family? What does that look like in terms of seeing that level of joy, um, meeting the needs of, you know, everybody in your household and being able to focus on your business at the same time? As far as me, because I associate with business owners a lot in my business, of course, through my uh, business. And one of the biggest things that they talk about and people have talked to ask me about is what all, what do you see are the keys? Uh, any types of uh, tips, tricks, I guess you could say, but as far as procedures that you would suggest of building that homework relationship of not being able to, or not bringing that stress into your um, home environment? Mm. Well, I think there ta- there, it does take an understanding and a whole and really effective communication with, you know, if you're talking partner with your children, that kind of thing, like, hey, I need to work from this hour to this hour. Um, and in terms of, okay, if something, you know, major happened in the office or within the business, how can I regulate myself? So I guess that would be a good thing. Like if I don't want that to spill over, I would have to regulate my emotions, remind myself, right? A good positive self-talk, remind myself that, hey, this, you know, this is pretty crappy what happened today or it was a bad day, but am I going to let that, you know, impact the rest of my day, right? And my delivery and the things I want, you know, outside of work. So you, it's kind of like being cognizant of that and learning to regulate that emotion and not letting it spill into. Do you have like a routine that you would kind of recommend as far as being able, whenever you come home to, to decompress, I guess you could say, uh, cause it seems like there, there is a time that used used to, especially, uh, I kind of use the drive whenever you commute, you kind of use that mm-hmm. drive, but now anybody stays on their phone anymore, uh, still doing business till the time that they get to their home. Uh, what, what do you have a routine that they would norm you would normally suggest as far as being able to mentally decompress before you hit the stress of go from the stress of business to the stress of home life? Yes. It it depends, you know, exact, you know, obviously what you're feeling, but it, you know, ways that I can decompress would be very good deep breathing. You can do some meditation and meditation could be minutes. It doesn't have to be, you know, this whole 20 minute affair. It could be, you know, five, 10 minutes of you doing that. Um, Deep breathing, you can help regulate and relax yourself on if you're driving home. Um, If you're working from home, you could do that before you leave your work area. Um, other things, you know, that I enjoy doing 
would be, you know, I have a whole bunch of tools and, you know, for rolling out any tension, you know, a roller for my back, my legs, you know, that kind mm -hmm. of thing. They also make them for the neck now, which is my latest um, obsession. And you just lay there and it releases the tension in your neck, which is quite nice. And it really does, you know, allow you to be like, oh, you know, that part is, you know, feels good now. And it really helps when you're connecting with others to be able to feel that tension from yourself leave. So really important to, before you try to jump in and tending to others in your family is to really tend to yourself. And I think that going into that, have you seen that a lot of, especially on the anxiety side of things, that the biggest part of with a new business owner is the idea of becoming overwhelmed, uh, the idea of, oh, I need to do this, I need to do that, and, and kind of build that anxiety. Uh, it, is that something that you see is common and what kind of suggestions do you usually give for someone that is going through that? Yeah, I would say it's pretty common as a business owner, especially like towards the end of the year, because you're looking at your next year and forecasting. Um, and so when you're planning that, you can get yourself into a whole lot of stress. So being mindful really helps keeping yourself in the present moment and being realistic. Um, how, you know, trying to organize yourself. Here are these must do's and things that I must have done um, versus what I would like. Right. So kind of really organizing yourself, setting a list of priorities and holding yourself accountable to those things. That helps a great deal with, you know, kind of once you get that on paper, it's out of your head. So it's not swirling around anymore. Um, you have it before you and then you can be proactive with it in terms of let me check that off. I completed that task and you no longer have to worry about it floating around up there, which can, you know, cause an a significant amount of stress on you and become overwhelming. Do you, do you see a significant difference between the amount of single business owners compared to married business owners that, that kind of need to seek the idea of uh, mental health of being able to cope with things? No, um, I think that that's pretty equal across the board. Because it all depends, you know, a lot of people who are in partnerships, you know, those have their own sets of struggles too, versus mm -hmm. someone who's single and the accountability factor is a little bit different um, in terms of that. So I would say not. And in terms of seeking therapy, a therapist uses a clinical approach versus if we're just relying on our partner, you know, to vent to. Versus a therapist mm -hmm. who can look at what you're going through, learn your personality, and help you develop a plan, really looking at collaborative care with the individuals mm -hmm. that we see. And that makes, you know, a huge impact on their life in that way. Because it always came to me, to the idea, for instance, my, my son, well, so more or less, I always wanted to be a business owner, but I didn't want to say I, mentally i always was afraid i guess you could say the idea of losing a paycheck to you know the the day-to-day -day to do that but the other idea was i didn't want to lose that time with my kids because mm -hmm. i was afraid of that leak over i guess you could say mm -hmm. to where now since they're 16 and older i kind of feel i have more time of my mm -hmm. time and then on the other side of that is my son kind of sees that and he sees it as okay well before i get to that point of i have a family i can take the extra time to build my business now that i'm young and i don't have a family in that stress mm -hmm. to i guess get that stuff in order mm -hmm. before the idea of having to having the two different roles i can be a i can be a business owner all day long mm -hmm. if i need to be compared to that and I was just curious if if you've kind of seen that or not mm -hmm. um, no uh, I haven't seen that much but I, I do I understand that approach which is you know not bad thinking on his part because he can establish himself the thing you know an individual like that say moving forward though when they're ready for a family they're gonna have to you know they'll make those adjustments then right and look at what they're gonna be able to do like, say you start, you know, a dating relationship, where's your time going to shift in that, right? You're no longer 
the 15 hour days might have to be 12, you know, or something like that, you know, regulating and making shifts in, in terms of that. And then once you start a family, what does your involvement look like? Can your business sustain itself? If you have some time away from that, you know, those long grueling days, will you have enough, you know, capital within your own business to start hiring, to have the help to afford you a little bit more free time and flexibility of when you work? Mm -hmm. Because especially whenever you first start your business, it's like, it's never ending of getting that clientele, I guess you could say that client Mm -hmm. base set up to where it uh, it can actually be a business and run itself compared to you having to put all that time and effort into it that you normally would. Yeah. The one way that I kind of did that too was um, my kids were... um, like grammar school and middle school age when I had gone back to graduate school. So I would spend, once I'd get them to bed at night, I would do all the things with them. I would attend school while they were in school, do all the things with them. And then once they went to sleep, I would study, you know? So I pulled time for my sleeping and my personal, you know, that time after they were asleep to use it to study and build. And then as I got into the field, I, again, I worked around their schedules in order to make all of that happen. So that's where I kind of pulled time so I could still be there and be present for them and all the things that they need and then still mm-hmm. continue to build. So do, one of my questions that I've always wondered is the importance of mental health. I mean, you, you whether you see go as far as the idea of so much gun violence and stuff like that, that we have now Mm -hmm. that we never had before. Uh, You know, they always talk about um, the need for gun laws and stuff. And a lot of people end up saying, we've had these guns around all the time and we never had this issue before. Mm -hmm. Uh, It all ends up getting tight. And I think that, do you think that as far as the gun violence and stuff like that, and the mental issues that those type of people were going through. Do you think that that really started to shed the light on the need for mental health? I don't think that that precipitated it. Like, I don't think that that started the push for the need, but I do think there's been more awareness and acknowledgement that mental health can play a significant role in helping people understand you know, themselves Mm -hmm. better and work through what they're experiencing that might help in terms of, you know, where the mindset is. I kind of see it as it's the, it was always there before Mm -hmm. the mental issues, but it's almost like that is whenever things got bad enough to where gun violence ended up starting higher, Mm -hmm. that that kind of brought the idea of the need to, to face it more to the forefront, I guess you could say, mm-hmm. is what I was thinking. Hmm. Okay. Uh, and the other thing, do you think that the advent of uh, the change from the mother, the older thing, the mother always staying at home and taking care of the home to the part of needing a two income family has been an issue as far as the idea of needing mental health because to me it's it's to the idea of used to while it's two separate jobs a lot of times that the man can come home or whoever the the earner is could come home and kind of vent you kind of talked about the venting idea of things of being able to kind of compress and Mm -hmm. and talk about it compared to now two people having really busy days mm-hmm. and not really wanting to be able to vent to each other at that point. Mm-hmm. Well, if they're not wanting to be able to vent to each other, they're both needing to decompress and then probably unite after that. You know, once they've had a few minutes to just kind of let that day go through them and then be able to talk about their day without maybe it being so heavy. Um, if that's what you're asking, but um, I don't think within itself, I obviously it wasn't uh, around back then in terms of, you know, the whole, I did stay at home with my kids when they were very young. And I think that that has its own stressors with just one income in the home. 
Um, but also there could be resentments that build and such if you're not able to fulfill yourself too. But, um, mm. you know, as a person who stays home, I think that comes with its own set of, you know. So I guess that rolling into that's kind of rolling into what's the best way whenever you come home in, in a family environment, mm -hmm. uh, especially two incomes of being able to vent without feeling the idea of feeling like you're downgrading the other person's hardworking day and being able to balance those to make sure that you have time for both sides to vent and relax about throughout the day. And I would say what I was saying, like decompressing, but also a huge amount of respect for each other in terms of, hey, I see, you know, maybe before spewing about your day, it'd probably be good to ask the other person how their day was, you know, show that real concern, really listen, don't just, you know, be like, oh, how was your day? And then let me look at my phone or tend to other things, but really give that one-on-one -on -one attention, the eye contact, you know, really let them know you're listening. You really care about what they have to say, you know, about their day. And then, you know, then they'll be more open hearing about your day as well, because they were able to kind of process with you what their day was like, regardless of what that was, you know, if they work out of the do, home. Do you find that, do you find that couples really have to work at that as far as the process of the idea of being able to both of you not just venting at the same time, but the process. And I, to me, as far as, hey, I'm in two very big failed relationships mm -hmm. uh, of the idea of being able to to go through the process. And it's kind of hard, I guess you could say, of here's my time, let me vent. Here's your time, let me, I'll let you vent without the clashing, I guess you could say. Because to me, it's it's really hard sometimes because of the stress of having someone on you all day and then suddenly someone venting up to me about their day and it's kind of hard to click off and not be defensive of, well, what about my day? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, do, do you kind of, I know that's kind of a convoluted question or, or kind of combusted, but the idea of the process, the idea of, okay, let's decompress. Now's your time. Now's my time. Mm -hmm. You know, let's kind of talk together at that point. Do you really see it as far as it taking a while for a, a couple to get that together in a good working process? It can if couples have never had that individually or in their families growing up and it's kind of new to them. It can take longer to, than if, you know, children were reared within that environment and they understand that, okay, here's how we interact with others in our home. Um, so, yeah, it can take couples a while to learn that, and that's completely normal, too. Versus, you know, and there's got to be a desire to want that to be part of how the relationship works as well. I, I think that you really hit a key point there, the idea of wanting to, to do it. And I think that mm -hmm. it's kind of hidden in some people, the idea of, well, of course I want to. But it's almost like, I don't say like a... Uh, being addicted to something, but it is something kind of in your subconscious that you kind of learn that you have to, you have to want to be able to, and see that there's an issue to be able to face it, I guess you could say, yeah. if that makes sense. Yeah. Right. Because I think that a lot of times that I've seen in my relationship is I, I kind of voice the idea of, well, calm down, let's talk about this. Mm -hmm. Well, I am calm. You know, you always hear, hear <laughs> yeah. that that uh, I am calm. Mm -hmm. uh, well, no, you're not. Listen to yourself. Well, mm -hmm. I'm fine. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. Very important to, when to, you're both to, heightened like, that you need to have that few minutes to calm yourselves and be able to talk in a rational and assertive way and not be passive aggressive. Now, the next thing that I kind of talk about is I, I'm, again, from uh, the country. And the old way of thinking it kind of carried down on 48 mm -hmm. to where, especially the stigma of males needing mental health. Mm -hmm. and, and you kind of see it a lot on the, I've seen it on a lot of TikToks. The idea uh, that kind of tells the old way of thinking for males is shut up and keep your emotions built in. Mm -hmm. 
if if you put your if you put your most if you're emotional then it's not very manly it's not very masculine it's not right. uh the way that you want to show as the man of the family i guess you could say uh, how much have you kind of had to fight that stigma to be able to to convince or get males to understand that they can they need to release that as well right uh that they're important to too them. right that their mental health matters right yeah exactly and, you know, in, in that is basically a lot of times just saying, you know, that matters too, because I know statistics, and if people tend to like to look at those, they're going to see that the statistics of women seeking therapy are higher than men. And that's mostly because men don't disclose their, their mental health issues with others. So as the stigma, you know, starts to kind of wipe away, wash away a bit, we're seeing more and more men come into therapy to address things because it's being normalized. And I do feel there's a positive aspect to things like TikTok and Instagram and those kind of social platforms in that way, helping relieve that the stigma for men. And there, we're seeing an uptick of men seeking out services as a result of that. So when there's a lot of negative things about social media, I feel like there's some positive ones in that regard because it's helping a lot of men who normally wouldn't seek it. And, and as far as, I guess, and, and this, I'll always say that I create these these questions. One, I have a group that kind of asks questions, but two, it's always been as far as, okay, building off of my experiences, I guess. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's the idea of, inside of dating, you end up having women that say that they want, want a man that has uh, that is in touch with their feelings and can express their feelings. Mm -hmm. But then whenever there's conflict or something building up with the female, and this goes both ways, don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. I, I can see it going both ways, not just as far as a male or whatever, but the idea of then suddenly the, the female saying, I want somebody that's more, you're supposed to be the man it's like I'm taking care of another kid. I've had that bit told to me before mm. of God, I always have to listen to your emotions. It's almost like I'm taking care of another kid. Mm -hmm. do, do you, do you still kind of see that in, in the environment today or, or am I just the unlucky one? <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Hence the reason I've been single for two. <laughs> um, I would say that that can, you know, like you said, that can go both ways. If the people are not open in the relationship in terms of helping each you know, meeting each other's needs in that way. So I would say a situation like that is the other person was probably not so in touch with caring for themselves and their own, perhaps their own emotional mm -hmm. state and, um, and maybe not feeling cared for themselves. So then to have to, you know, it would be a have to in terms of caring for their partner in that way, if they're not, if it's not mutually mm. being done. So yeah, I could see where there'd be some resentment that could build in another partner that way. Looking into as far as business owners, do you, have you seen, to me, it used to be the idea of mental health was a total, it was, it wasn't putting the importance wasn't put on it enough by employers. Everything was an elect, as you would say, like an elective uh, type of service to where it's not required by insurance and stuff like that. Have you seen more of insurance and business owners or businesses providing coverage for mental health? Yes. Um, you know, the pandemic taught us a lot in that regard. That's how we're able to you know, because a lot of bills went to Congress and whatnot. I'm not very political, so I don't know all of the exacts of it. But in order for us to provide te telehealth, where all insurances before would not cover it, some, there are still some insurances out there that don't allow like a telehealth visit, and they might cap how many mental health visits, you know, just like a chiropractic visit. Well, you can have 10 a year, which is still pretty ridiculous. So... <laughs> There are some insurance companies that do need to step it up to meet where everyone else, the other ones are at. But yes, I do see more and more insurances covering those services. But, you know, covering in yeah, terms yeah. of you're going to have your deductible copay, that kind of thing going on. 
and I kind of see that, uh, kind of like you talk, I still see a lot of, in, or think of a lot of insurances are in those types. It's kind of like chiropractic. I, I talked to my chiropractor whenever I first went there and they said the way that, that it is, is to be able to get insurance going on, you have to say that there's an issue mm -hmm. and you have so much to fix that issue mm -hmm. compared to, okay, we're going to fix the issue, but you need ongoing type of treatment to make sure that issue doesn't come back. Right. Do, is that pretty much the way that you kind of see that? If with some insurances, yes, um, they will call and do reviews every few months or, you know, and then once you pass that review, they'll say, okay, we'll continue to allow, you know, X, Y, Z person to be able to be seen. Um, and they'll call again. We're like, oh, we'll call again in six months. We'll see how they're doing. So then, yeah, there are things where they'll call and you'll do a review of care um, in terms of where I think you were hinting at diagnoses. You know, depending on where that person is at, there are several of those. Insurance requires us to assign a diagnosis. Um, and they do look at, okay, well, if this person, say, if you have adjustment disorder, they will pay for that for six months. But if you continue after that, it's no longer an adjustment disorder. You're looking at what is still going on with this client that they continue to need to be seen. That's meaning there's a different mm -hmm. diagnosis involved. Yeah. Looking at uh, a lot of, I guess, and I, again, this is going into some of my things and associating. There's a there's a fine line. It looks to seems to me between the idea of being uh, depressed and uh, anxiety, and they kind of cause each other sometimes. As far as what I've seen, mm -hmm. uh, what would you suggest to somebody that I know that mental health, as far especially as far as depression. That, that's a deeper issue. Mm -hmm. that, that's something that you kind of have to talk. There isn't like a magical procedure of this is what you should do. Mm -hmm. But the idea of, I guess my question is, is what's the balance or the learning part for somebody that has these issues to understand that there is an issue that needs to be taken care of compared to, oh, it's just me. Right. Um, well, that would be when, you know, if you, if you're talking about before they consider seeking mental health, like, am I feeling mm -hmm. this way more days than not for more parts of the day than not parts of the day? You know, if you're looking at some of the basic things, how long have I been feeling this way? You know, and seeing that, you know, someone in that, that mindset, sometimes that is, a, you know, more of a depressive thought in a way, or if they're highly anxious, so that's my identity. You know, I'm just an overall mm -hmm. anxious person instead of, okay, well, did you ever address that and see what's going on there and what's precipitating those types of things within yourself? So it's, you know, they often might need someone to be like, hey, you know, I noticed you haven't been yourself. You know, you're normally this way. That sometimes that helps them gain awareness. But if they don't have that individual, if they notice within themselves, hey, I've been feeling this way a little bit longer than you know, I'd like to, and it doesn't mm. feel like me, then then they know, hey, this is a good time to get out and seek some additional help. And, that's a, and it's the idea also, I think, of the importance of having that circle that notices the differences and, and aren't afraid to, mm -hmm. to say, hey, I think you should, uh, I've noticed this. Right. <laughs> are, are you okay? Yeah. And I think that... Uh, I think that's a key phrase that a lot of people don't hear enough. And that's mm -hmm. the idea of someone saying, are you okay? Right. Do you need help? Is there anything I can do for you? Right. To, to build up on or help with that type of issue. Yeah. Having a support system, uh, that support network is critical for, for everybody. And I think that, you know, pre pandemic, we had more of that and, we're getting back to more of that as now it's more normal to be out again, but there was definitely a lot of isolation during that pandemic. And a lot of people didn't have those others to notice those things. And then I found there sometimes the most dangerous thing is being alone with your own thoughts. Yeah. If you don't know how to work through them, most definitely it could be. <laughs> yeah. That's the part of to, a lot of times being able to, I'm not a, I'm a very introvert. Mm -hmm. 
you know, kind of separate, but the idea of some, a lot of times talking to others and stuff, it kind of keeps your mind away from a lot of your problems and being able to enjoy that time right? compared to being isolated. It's you, you think about every little thing that's wrong with yourself a lot of times. <laughs> <laughs> if you're very nitpicky at yourself, yeah, you could get down yeah. a rabbit hole real easy. <laughs> Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And, and and do people kind of see those things as being tied together sometimes, or do you see that as far as the idea of you're depressed to the idea of you get anxiety about every little thing and the type of issues that come around? Yeah, anxiety and depression can piggyback each other at times. So, yeah, someone can, you know, I like to say, like, you can think yourself into oblivion. Um, so, mm. but it's, you know, that's where therapy helps in digging yourself out of it. Yeah, I do feel they can piggyback each other if, if that's what you were asking. Um, and again, it's just important to be able to seek help for that. And what do you kind of see as things that someone that does have anxiety that I, I know that as far as uh, you talk about breathing meditation, is there any other things that especially during the hard times, whenever you start to have uh, an anxiety attack, shaking, stuff like that, that you really need to learn to calm down that you can suggest to people as far as the th that they can do it during that time? Yeah, if you're in the middle of an anxiety attack, grounding techniques are really good where you kind of look around, what are five things I can see? You know, what are four things I can smell? Three things I can touch? You know, um, two things I can, you know, you like you bring in all the five senses. What can I hear? What can I feel? See, touch, taste. Um, and then you're focusing on that and you're calming your system. The deep breathing, again, that is physiologically one of the best things we can do for ourselves. A lot of people, you know, it's hard to get them on board with that until they really hone in on a good practice of it. Um, that you see that it physio physiologically really does calm your system. But if you're in the midst of an anxiety attack, we've seen grounding techniques really be pivotal in helping get that body, you know, the system from here to here. How, how busy do you see, especially, and I'll go on and, and preface this so that I don't just keep stuttering. So I've talked to you or, or mentioned the part of me having ADD mm -hmm. or the thoughts of me having ADD. Uh, I don't have the ADHD because I definitely don't have the hyper part of it. <laughs> At least that's what I <laughs> But like I went to my doctor and I talked to, to the doctor about mm -hmm. me having ADD. Mm -hmm. He can't prescribe necessarily uh, an ongoing thing uh, as far as drugs until you get diagnosed, you know, diagnosed for it officially. I get pointed to the the place that I can go to and it's six months out before I can even get in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's the idea. Of, and then it's after you get there, it's a four hour right um, diagnosis process of going through uh mm -hmm. to get diagnosed and, and then i'm the, mm -hmm. already the type of crap i don't want to do that <laughs> right <laughs> you know, the idea of <laughs> of people drilling on me or mm -hmm. the idea of am i giving the right answer because i know i need help with this mm -hmm. what can what do you kind of see as far as that process and the idea of do you kind of see that being an issue or the part of so many people needing mental health now that it's kind of flooded our system, especially non-private of, of being able to get diagnosed properly. Yeah. I think a lot of that is psychologists. Not every, um, not every licensure can perform the test, the battery of tests. So psychologists, typically there's a wait for that because those tests take, as you said, four hours, some of them take eight hours. They could be longer, um, all depending on what they're testing for. So they're not, you can't, you know, if you go in and just ADHD, they're going to look at other things. What could be impacting that too? So the test, there's no right or wrong way to answer them except for this is how my, what my experience is, right? And mm -hmm. then they take and they, you know, score those tests to, you know, to kind of see and hone in on what is particularly going on with you specifically. So I feel that it's great to have that battery of tests to, and the opportunity to sit and do that. 
the wait times, unfortunately, sometimes it's quicker than others, all depending on where you where you are. But again, like if you're in a more rural area, your wait time can increase significantly if there's not enough people, you know, um, available in that circumference in order to, to wait, you know, to wait on you. And mm. that's where I feel like as telehealth becomes more prominent in things and they're able to do, because right now it's in office a lot for testing. So if they develop mm -hmm. ways in which that more testing can be, you know, a remote situation, it might help things a little bit. Yeah, because my issue, I end up waiting that long and then end up being on a specific day that something ha ended up going on with my kids and I had to re go to reschedule and they couldn't get me in again for another six months. Right. <laughs> so... So, yeah, you definitely got to make that you... appointment once you get it. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. Uh, what is... age? I guess you can. For instance, I always, and I'm talking about myself as far as with ADD going through. I've always, and I I say this just so other people kind of think about their issues or, or is this stuff that's affecting them. Mm -hmm. I've always had an issue focusing, although in the past I always had a good, I've always been relatively smart as far as I picked up on things easy, mm -hmm. but I always took me a little bit of focus. For instance, whenever I took notes in college, I would separate the page, a regular notebook in three sections. And I wrote, I don't know if you ever seen like those, uh, where the people that used to write on rice, you know, I don't know if you've ever seen those. They used to have little necklaces and stuff of where they'd have a little piece of rice and somebody wrote really small on it. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Like your name and stuff. Mm -hmm. I wrote really small and I had like three pages on one page. Oh, wow. To where I really find, because what I, I, and I do it now, I end up, whenever I try to study, I put a the page really small because my thoughts trail off by the time I get to the end. If it's short, I can, my eyes move, mm -hmm. but if I, if it's too big of font or something like that, mm -hmm. and I got to go all the way across the page, my thoughts are already gone, but, <laughs> <laughs> and I don't concentrate as well. Mm -hmm. And I kind of noticed that more as I got older, mm -hmm. along with, as I've gotten older, I don't pick up on things as much. Do you kind of see uh, a lot of people that kind of have that, or how do you kind of face that with people? of understanding that things aren't always the way that they, well, granted, I know that people understand that there's changes when you get older, but that's also mentally as well, mm -hmm. I guess you could say. Yeah, I would say maybe in your case, and I, you know, there's been no assessment or anything, so I, I'll lead with that. But, um, you know, as you continue to grow your business and such, you may, there might be a level of overwhelm that has you, you know, drifting off more because there's more to tend to. So it would be organizing and prioritizing each individual thing that you need to accomplish. My thing, and, and uh, this isn't a Jamie clinical, <laughs> <laughs> but, but for me, I get, I get overwhelmed enough that I don't want to do anything. So let's not do anything. Mm -hmm. You'll shut down. Like even scheduling this or the idea of, Oh man, I got to do a, an interview. Mm -hmm. Now, after I get to the interview, just like now, I enjoy talking and stuff, but it's the whole thought of having to get started and motivated and going mm -hmm. that it ends up being a problem for me that I just more or less say, well, I'm not going to do it. Right. Instead of building up. And that's, that's why I always wondered if other people kind of face that a lot of the idea uh, along with ADD. And that's why I've kind of... Mm -hmm. I guess kind of self-diagnosed the idea of that of it, it it's almost like i'm 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 over, overwhelmed before i got started and thought of yeah. getting overwhelmed when I, I would definitely I say that started. that's part of it for sure <clears throat> do uh now with a especially and i'm talking about add uh because it's so out there anymore the idea of that uh, to me it's Something that nobody really talked about unless you had the little kid that just couldn't sit still mm -hmm. to where now you see a lot of AD, uh, ADD commercials, uh, 
yep. the idea of it being so widespread. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the and the part of my question is is I'm getting to it is companies that do it not without Adderall. What have you seen as far as the non uh, medical type of diagnosis or the way that you deal with things becoming po- more popular and what kind of you kind of see in those? Just like I always, I don't have the box, but one of them. Like I'm with thesis right now, or tried that. Mm-hmm. They have different types of of non. Oh right, yeah. I mean, prescription type thing. I know people have gone into looking at supplements, which is great, but doing other things, you know, more proactively too, would be, you know, maybe setting up a contingency management. And if you have the testing, you would see because there's different things to look at in terms of it. Is it memory issue? Is it executive functioning? You know, is it slow processing? What's going on there? And that helps you target which areas you can work on more specifically to see what that makeup is in order to make that significant change for yourself. So it all depends uniquely on that individual and what their symptomology is and what's Mm. going on once they have that testing to really see where those deficits could be for themselves and how to progressively work on that. So say if someone is more fidgety you know, non-Italian, you know, who talk with their hands, Um, you know, they Mm -hmm. make fidgets now and that really helps calm the system and person, you know, ability to focus more. So it all kind of depends on that unique individual as well. Uh, I don't know if you could tell that's why I'm kind of, I'm always like moving around Mm -hmm. in my seat and stuff like that. So, because I think that a lot of the people, and I see this a lot of on Facebook of the idea of, with ADD, that it's not that you're lazy. Right. <laughs> and and right. I think that that's part of the, the stigma that a lot mm-hmm. of people kind of face of like, I don't want to say anything. They're just going to say I'm lazy. Right. You know, and it's not lazy. I, I, and I kind of use, I try to use this as my therapy also, mm-hmm. you, but you'll kind of notice like the little things whenever I go to talk, I get to the part of where I, I go to talk and yes, audience, I know you kind of notice this. And, but the part of, I start on a line of, of thinking. And then I think, wait a minute, what did I say? Oh, well, that's going to think that's going to sound stupid. Let's kind of rethink it. <laughs> and, yeah. But I understand that the more I kind of do it, the better I'm going to be at it. But it's the, mm-hmm. the process of, of, of the thought process of, I know what I want to say it, but I think about how I want to say it in the middle of it. Oh, <laughs> right. Yeah. 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 And suddenly, well, I think about, oh, well, in the middle of it, oh, well, it'll, it'll sound better if I say it this way mm-hmm. to where, and then I'm starting to stumble of, okay, which the best way to say it as I'm presenting it, mm-hmm. if that makes sense. Yeah. So, so it sounds it, like rehearsal, it, right? Like you would need more of a rehearsal. Exactly. Here are the things I want to talk about. Let me see what this looks like for myself. So, and again, again, I'm not meaning this as a a therapy session for me, but the idea of for everybody else, uh, anybody that goes through that, the idea of, of it, it's not necessarily just you and think negatively on yourself. It's something that can be uh, a mental type of issue that you need to address. Right. And the idea of there's people now, especially now of ways to diagnose that and work that, mm-hmm. that out. Yep. Uh, what do you kind of see as far as any other things that business owners kind of specifically uh, end up having issues with? In terms of mental health or running the business? Correct. Yeah. That, that you kind of see them for. Yeah. Oh, like business owners who come in. Definitely a lot of stress, mm-hmm. um, trauma and how previous trauma can play in the development of their business and Maybe they're set in their ways in a certain thing because this happened in the past. So kind of looking at how do I navigate and, you know, push forward in my business to be successful. Here are the things I want. Here's what I maybe have to work through. If you're looking at like, you know, upbringing in your family and how those internal family systems all work, you know, and they mold us who we are, right? And how we carry ourselves. So what are the good parts of that that I want to take with me in growing my business? And what are the things I really need to work through 
you know, and integrate in order to become more successful in what I want for myself. And that kind of reminded me, I have had people ask, what what's the best way that you, as far as coping with trauma or grief at a time of being able to do that and still function when you know that you have a business as well? That's what right. you tell for those people? Yeah, that's where I feel a lot of people comp compartmentalize if you know hey like for you example say you were having a really bad morning before this interview it would be like a you need to reschedule this interview but say you couldn't it would be like okay i need to you know regulate my emotion i need to be able to put aside what is bothering me right now in order to do this you know this interview how can i pull that apart you know and separate that for myself right now because this situation doesn't define me and I've got to look at what I can do and what I want for myself, right? This is something you really enjoy to do. So say, hey, this might be something really crappy going on right now, but we're going to table it until I can focus better on it later and work through it. Mm -hmm. And what about especially the parts of going through the levels of, gr of grief or something like that uh, to, to be able to m work on your mental health and, and go through that process? Uh, but as far as being able to, the idea of business doesn't always come first, take care of your mental health. Right. And that would be including, you know, you're seeing a therapist, you're doing the things outside of therapy that you and your therapist talk about. That's really huge. Um, therapy, you know, that's one hour of your week that you'll sit with someone, but what you do with the rest of your week matters. So using, you know, that therapy session too, to make sure that you're doing the things outside for yourself and caring for yourself to definitely make progress for what you're looking and what you came to therapy for. So that's, that's going to be paramount in being successful in that area. So I know I, I really would like to have you back on and for the teaching session. If there's okay. any uh, spe specifically just hit a point on one thing, maybe that or anything else, as far as steps okay. to be that somebody could take to be able to decompress or what have you. Mm -hmm. uh, but, what what else would you say as far as that you would want to tell business owners to be able to deal with stress and day-to-day -day life easier at this point? Hmm. Well, that's a really good question. I would say, you know, definitely if you can exercise, nutrition, sleep, making sure you have routines, right? The more structured you are the easier it is for you to navigate all the things that a business owner has to do and have a family, right? Or friends or social life, whatever, whatever have you that your whole identity doesn't become just your business and looking at organize, you know, organization, what does that look to you in order to have all of those things that you want? So really structuring yourself, organizing yourself, you know, and executing it. The hardest thing for business owners, especially as solo ones, is accountability because if you don't have someone else right there's no ceo or whatever you're all of those things so being able to hold yourself accountable to accomplish the things that you want to would be paramount as well and often that could be if you're working mostly at home going to a coffee shop you know anything like that that can to get you going in terms of stressors journaling helps you know in addition to the breathing the grounding techniques meditation you know, doing all those things really does make a significant difference. Yoga is huge. So, so more or less the, the idea of making sure that you find time for yourself yeah. to decompress, mm -hmm. whether that's one thing that a lot of people don't do, especially me anymore, is the idea of exercising mm -hmm. to be able to, to kind of work that out. But it's if you see commercials and stuff talking about running the idea of that you're alone time with your thoughts in a healthy way mm -hmm. compared to making it being a, a deconstructive type of right of time of being with yourself yeah and for someone who doesn't enjoy to exercise stretching you know stretching also feels really good it can help relieve a lot of tension in your body so that definitely is one of the one of the greater things that's where you know yoga and the whole idea of that coming in mm -hmm. if you don't want to practice yoga that's fine but learn how you know how to have a good stretch routine and that could you know make a huge difference in your life too yeah that's another one of those things that i i've kind of found i've always liked stretching and stuff mm -hmm. but it, it, the whole stigma 
still everybody has to get over the old stigma for a man of yoga only women do yoga right eh, there's a whole there's a whole lot of things out there that that you could do yeah exactly with, with that how tell everybody how they can kind of follow your business and contact you and type of services that you or as far as do you have if you have any type of social media or anything like that oh yeah um, I have a website, baileybehavioralhealth.com. I'm on Instagram, and that's, uh, again, Bailey Behavioral Health. I'm not sure where the whole the, the at things work. Um, I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on Twitter. Um, I think it's called X now, sorry. Um, and recently on TikTok, all under Bailey Behavioral Health. And I said right. Instagram. Yeah. So, I mean, that's how they can they can hit me, hit me up. And usually if you go to my website, you can click on those social medias and it'll take you straight to there too. And it's great. I didn't, like I said, I went and going to your website that I being able to see the therapists that you have and the special specialities mm -hmm. that they have. So the idea of being able to, to know that there's, you have the, the expertise to be able to handle the issues that right. you might be having. Mm -hmm. okay, so. Yeah, I have that as part of my so, business plan and looking to meet the needs of people around the area. Yep. So with that, thank you very much for the time and oh, taking you. the time to talk with me. I know we've been working on this one for a while. Yeah, so thank you for having me. I really well, appreciate we, it. Hopefully we can get to your schedule for uh, the deep dive teaching sometime. Right. And, may, and if, if you have any questions or anything, make sure that you leave a comment. Uh, again, we always check the comments and I pass those along to my guests to make sure that they have those uh, if need be, uh, if you don't contact them directly. And please go ahead and leave a message to, to thank Diane for being here with us today. Mm -hmm. So with that, again, I, I value your, your time and I appreciate mm -hmm. you being here. Uh, and with that, God bless and take care of your business. Yes, you as well. Thanks. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.